Hey, everybody. Welcome in. Sunday night version TDR, Small Cap Sunday podcast. I am your host, Shad Dales. Another five groups of companies that we're going to unveil to you tonight. Got some interesting ones. Once again, they range between $100 million and $1.2 billion in market cap. And most importantly, we once again highlight our cannabis pick of the week. Who is it? Well, let's jump into it and welcome in TDR lead financial writer and analyst, Bill McNarlin. Happy Sunday evening. How are you, sir? Doing well. Thank you very much. Yourself? You getting much heat out west? Man, it is a heat. You know what? Actually, I, I, like we, there's still snow in the mountains. Uh, actually, uh, two days ago, I saw a little bit of frost on our uh, garage roof. But uh, today, I'm, I, I plan to turn on the air conditioning. So. <laughs> still happy living there, though. You going to Mexico oh, anytime soon again? And uh, July 15th. Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, tonight, as I said, five new companies uh, we're going to feature. Uh, one is a collector of a manufacturing business. Another is a corn and carbon business. Third company is a shoe company. We also have an orange juice company based out of the state of Florida in over 54,000 acres of land. So that's an interesting. And then finally, our cannabis stock of the week, which I think a lot of people will be interested to see our breakdown of multi-state operator Verano Holdings. So <laughs> Uh, interesting stuff to say the least, but before we get into it, all views on the TDR small cap podcast and the guests on this podcast are purely opinion. You should not treat any opinions expressed by us or guests as investment advice. And the views on this podcast are solely intended to be informational and are not investment advice as I fix my hair. Um, all right, let's begin with our first company. As mentioned earlier, it's a diversified manufacturing company. So first up, Bill, before we get into the name of the company, how would you best describe what a diversified manufacturing company is. Well, sometimes we see Jay Leno in the news and we know that he has a huge collection of cars and he's very passionate yep. about them. This is a group of three gentlemen that started a business that wanted to collect manufacturing companies. And they had a background. One gentleman was a, a lawyer. One gentleman was a portfolio manager, analyst like myself. And the other gentleman was a banker with a tremendous amount of experience. And they saw a niche where they could get together, buy these businesses, forever and just uh, earn income so that they could uh, pay dividends to shareholders and earn their uh, share as well. Okay. So with that, we've now highlighted our first company and it's called the Decisive Dividend. They're based out of Kelowna, BC, Canada, market cap, $99 million USD. I will add, they trade on the TSX venture under the ticker symbol DE. Current share price is $7.02. So now that you've kind of described what a uh, diversified manufacturing company is, what is their story and why does it interest you? Yeah, so there, there was a, a business model very similar before this uh, called Exchange Income Corp out of Winnipeg. Um, they started in 2004 and they went from zero to $2 billion uh, in uh, 20 years. And what they saw a niche was there was business owners that wanted to sell businesses but were very concerned about the outcome of the business. They wanted to make sure that uh, the, the new owners would take care of the employees, wouldn't yeah. close down their legacy and such. And so this group came together and said, you know, we'll we'll buy the business. We're not going to sell these businesses or flip them. We're just going to continue to own them. And so now they own 14 different uh, manufacturing companies of all different things. Um, and they uh, have it together that you can purchase it in uh, in one unit. When you bring up the idea of outcomes of business and some of the concerns they have, can you give us kind of an example as to what you're referring to when you mention that? Yeah, I was doing some research about this and you can find out about what business owners are, are really concerned about. So there was a survey by the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. And okay. what we find out is that 76 of business owners plan to exit their business with the next 10 years. So that's significant. 76. Oh, it's huge. But what, what is interesting is what is their main uh, objectives in selling the business? The number one objective is protecting the current employees. That's hmm. actually ahead of getting the highest uh, possible price. And then wow. they're concerned about ensuring a legacy. For. Yeah, for sure. And they also want to ensure that business stays in the community. Um, but you know what? The number one group that owners want to sell to is someone unrelated to them in their family. Unrelated yes. to their family. They don't want the family drama of coming over for Thanksgiving dinner and no you know and and having to deal with someone in your family that you're not very excited with how they're running your legacy. 
Yeah. Well, as they say, it takes three generations to kill a business, right? Absolutely. So then this group saw this as, as an opportunity and said, we can make that commitment to business owners. But the beauty of a private company is you buy it a lot cheaper than a public company. For sure. So it's very accretive. They bring these businesses in, but yet they can get equity cheaper than the private company. And also they can get private capital or debt lines cheaper. So it makes total sense for them to be accretive in bringing these businesses together. Well, I would think that just the current landscape of the corporate environment over the last decade, two decades, when it comes to buyouts, uh, I can understand why just the uh, protecting employees is probably at the uh, top of the food chain, so to speak. Because how many times have we seen private companies get bought up by corporations only to see those dissolve within a number of years after that? And I don't think that's obviously the legacy, but that's an interesting stat that employees comes at the top of the list. And like I said earlier, probably a good company that you should be uh, working for, right? Yep, absolutely. And they also want to keep the business in the community, but it's also that legacy. And you can see this, you know, you started an amazing business. Now you want to sit at the cottage, but you want to make sure that this is still a nice business in the community doing the right yeah. things. You can see why the legacy is so important as well. All right. So how would you best describe uh, their company stage? Like what is it currently in right now? Yeah, you know, I, I would say that this is a, a mature company, you know, they can pay their bills, there's no concerns about that. But they are still in a growth stage, you go on their website. And the, and the first thing you you kind of see, is they're like, hey, if you want to sell a business, please send us an email. So they're, they're still actively uh, growing. Uh, but they're they're a mature company and established company for sure. Okay, so they've been around for a while, established, established, and not borrowing any money as well as they highlight this. So, based on having uh, uh, positive cash flow, you want to break down some numbers when it comes to that. Yeah, so they, they do have a, a reasonable use of debt; they can get bank lend uh, debt, but they don't need that for their operations. That's just for a uh, suitable amount of leverage, um, so that they can uh, boost their uh, dividends and earnings. Uh, okay. But they, they have, they're established, you know, last year in the last 12 months, they had $113 million of uh, revenue, but it, it's their stats I'll run through now. There's just no flaws. Like last year, their uh, growth on revenue was 20.4% the last 12 months. Okay. Three years, it was 40.7. Five years, it was 28.8. So they're just clipping wow. along on this thesis where you buy a company at a reasonable valuation, you yep. honor the intentions of the business owner, and you just start collecting the revenue out of that company. Okay. So speaking of buying companies, their portfolio, as you said earlier, consists of 14 current companies. There's some notable names within their portfolio that you could share. Yeah. And they're all different. Uh, you know, you got Blaze King, which makes uh, wood and gas stoves. You have Hawk, which is uh, precision machinery. Uh, Tech Belt does food and beverage packaging. Uh, Procore uh, manufactures industrial radiators. These okay. aren't exciting names, but these are names of companies that consistently are putting out uh, free cash flow. And well, so this is uh, the beauty of it. I was going to say, well, how should one analyze? But based on some of the feedback and stats, cash flow is king, and they are actually performing really well. Okay, so we look at these charts. What did you find when it came to revenue in the last twelve months? So the revenue in the last twelve months was one hundred and thirteen uh, million. Um, it came down, you know, that they had twenty one million dollars of EBITDA uh, last year. Um, wow. That's, uh, yeah, and, and also that they had some significant uh, depreciation. Um, so okay. their net income is a little bit different from their EBITDA, but uh, the leverage free cash flow was eleven point six million dollars last year. So for a company that you can purchase for one hundred and thirteen million to be producing eleven point six million of leverage free cash flow, this is a, a very uh, interesting opportunity. Did you find any short term growth catalysts for the uh, company? You know, just keep doing what they're doing, and now that yeah, time I'm is kidding. coming because we're getting later into the cycle of people retiring. And so there's going to be more and more interest in this business uh, when people are looking for someone to acquire them. Hmm. Very good point. And yes, a lot of people are going to be retired relatively soon. It's already actually begun. But what does their current balance sheet look like? Oh, it's strong. Like they, they came in through a credit score of 6.6. .6. Uh, the current ratio is 1.9. So liquidity is not an issue. And they have a conservative um, debt situation. It's mostly funded through bank debt. Um, they have a 62 cents a debt for a dollar of assets, and that's mm -hmm. where they plan on keeping it in that range. And they use a little bit of debt to be able to uh, purchase these businesses. 
um, and, and then they uh, supplement that with some equity as well. Okay. And finally, uh, you said earlier, credit score again is what? Yeah, the credit score is 6.6. .6 and and uh, so strong. it's very, very strong. There's no issues here. But what's uh, what, you're not surprised. You know, they have a portfolio manager and also a banker that uh, founded the, the company besides a lawyer. So they, they understood how to come up with the ratios. Um, but the beauty here is you're getting paid to wait on their thesis. So the dividend yield right now is 7.7. .7. Uh, the three-year dividend growth has been 10.1. And wow. the five-year dividend growth has been 5.9. And that so includes awesome. going through the period of COVID and stuff. So this is good news. Okay. So as you said, just keep doing what you're doing. So moment of truth, grab your green marker. I think we got our first green check mark. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. This is a very intriguing business. It's a very easy to go through. I understand the thesis and uh, companies that have done similar things have done very, very well. All right. So there's your first check mark. All right. On to company number two. It is a corn and carbon capture company. Sounds wordy. So again, explain to us what that is. You know, um, basically their, their original business is they take corn and turn it into high valued ingredients. So I'm just going to put this uh, picture up on the screen. Now you can see what industries uh, they supply and who their uh, clients are. So for example, they do anything from uh, fine alcohol for perfumes um, to ingredients that are needed for dog food. Um, okay. So it's, it's very diverse. But the idea is that corn, you know, the value is low. And so they try to take it up the value chain as high as they can uh, to increase their profit margins. That's their original longstanding business. But now they're shifting into carbon capture. And uh, that's what really caught uh, my attention. Okay, so the company is called Alto Alto Ingredients, which trades at the Nasdaq under the ticker symbol ALTO. Currently trading at a dollar thirty. I will note that it has it, the stock has been down ninety nine percent since it started trading way back in two thousand and six. Do I also want to highlight that Bill Gates was actually one of the early investors in this company. In this company, however, as I said, even though it is down ninety nine percent, this company does have your interest. Explain to us why. Yeah, you know, and part of the the stock falling is uh, so this was kind of like a Nvidia back in two thousand and six. So if you weren't okay. investing in two thousand and six, all that people <clears throat> only wanted to talk about ethanol and energy and oil. Tech was dead at that point in dead. time. It was dead, and so everything's cyclical. So that that's the first point of the of the learning. And so I remember this thesis that people had in two thousand and six that the U.S. was going to become an energy superpower through corn. And, uh, and this got a lot of traction, you know, and it was awful because corn prices were exploding. It, it was putting up the prices of tortillas in Mexico. Uh, people couldn't, uh, it was costing them a lot to feed their families. It was yeah. a really, <clears throat> it was a strange scenario. So people said, I'm going to go out and invest. And there were smart people like Bill Gates uh, put over a hundred million dollars in two rounds into this company. Wow. And um, this was before the company's hardly producing anything. This, wow. is, this was an idea concept. And at that time, this company, based on the, the charts I looked at, had a market cap of $300 billion. And now it's around $100 million. So that's a, a big, interesting story that I remember uh, very well. So if I'm looking at that on paper, I've got uh, alarm bells left, like left, right and center. So again, like what are you seeing here that maybe the average investor isn't? Well, first of all, you know, I, I have some interest in in taking raw commodities and putting them into something of value. And so there's two things here. We'll see, you know, charts that affect that business. The first one is you have to look what is the price of the original ingredient like corn? And what is the price that you're trying to turn it into, like ethanol, which is the base of these more valuable uh, uh, products. And so the idea okay. is that you're trying to get a spread between those two. And, and you have to invest a lot in CAPEX. You have to build these factories. You have to uh, sure. build all these refineries. And it's an interesting business um, if you can hit the timing right and such. And there's some volatility there. And um, But if you can buy these businesses cheap enough, the big expense is putting all the CAPEX together, building everything. And this has been done years ago. And so you look through the numbers and you want to see, okay, well, how is this company doing? I was interested. But then I found out that they were shifting into carbon capture and expect okay. to get revenue off this 
um, starting Q4 of this year. And so they spent $30 million at CAPEX um, in this area. And carbon capture is strong. Why is it strong? Can you explain why? So McKinsey, um, the company, has done some research. And there's many countries that want to go to a, a net zero uh, carbon footprint. Um, to get there, we have to expand 120 times our capacity globally by 1950. Which, or, sorry, by the year 2050. 2050. So, yeah. so this is a, is a huge thing that has to be done. And so this yeah. company is seeing the opportunities and how it relates to their current operations. And so they are have invested into this. Um, and, and the interesting thing about this is they feel, they predict that in the coming year, that they could produce about $30 million of EBITDA a year off this for a company that has a market cap of $100 million. So this is kind of like an old established company that is shifting into a new area of interest. So the CapEx infrastructure has built years in the past. And now imagine being part of that investor presentation back in 2006. All it's going to take is a little over 18 years for us to start producing $30 million of EBITDA at the end of the day. But regardless, we're here and now. So current cash flow, uh, what's the current situation of this company? Yeah, so this was the situation I had to look at. So the revenue is $1.1 billion. So this is right. Okay. They make a okay. lot off their traditional business. Um, and over over the last three years, that's been a growth of 10.9%. Uh, okay. But it's a very margin thin business. Um, their gross profit margin in the last year was 1.4. Now that can swing yeah. if yeah. you get the spread between ethanol and corn. Um, that could also contract. So it's, it's a business that you know, in the last 12 months had an EBITDA of $6.5 million. Um, it's an interesting business, but not enough to capture my opinion like the uh, the carbon business that they're they putting together. All right, so current market cap, we look at that, it's currently 100 million. Outstanding shares is 76 million. And you best describe this company as being in the mature growth stage, correct? Yeah, and they've, they've invested in everything. Like the last two years, their CAPEX spend was $68.8 million. Um, they still have about $20 million that they're going to spend in 2024, but that's going to get them into the carbon business and producing additional EBITDA outside of their traditional business. When you're spending that kind of money, like what kind of runway are we looking at here for the company? They got working capital right now of $95 million and they have a credit line of 91. Okay. So they have the ability to do this. So I, the way I view this is we look at a lot of technology companies in our research or biotech. And a lot of times they're like, you know, I got nine months of cash flow and revenue may not be for five or six years. This is an interesting area of growth and it's going to be producing by Q4 of this year. Um, and the CAPEX has already been spent. So this is what caught my attention. This might be one of the most interesting stories you've had since we launched this show, but a stock has been now 99%. CapEx has been spent uh, a lot over the course of since it started trading in 2006, but you firmly believe that now is the time potentially that we could see a turning point for this company 18 years later. Yeah, and the one thing I would share is when you look at the balance sheet, the value of the company after you paid off all its debt yeah. is $3.38. But that includes tons of depreciation. So the assets are worth more than that for sure. And it's trading at $1.28. So mm -hmm. it's backed by so many assets. Well, and when you money break it down like spent, right? Yeah. When you break it down like that, that's what investors need to like, I guess, understand and learn. But one dollar thirty cents is the current uh uh share price right now, but upside potential you think of over three dollars and what was it, sixty cents? Yeah, the uh wind up value is uh uh, $3.38, but I think it's uh, quite a bit more. And then if you get it producing the EBITDA estimates that management thinks, yeah. um, this is going to be a stock that would be worth a lot more than it is today. Give them credit for sticking to what they wanted to do over time. But finally, another green marker, check mark. Is this a stock that you would own? Yeah, I'm very, this is interesting. Like if someone came to me and said, here's a new company with a carbon capture idea, my excitement level would be limited because a lot can go wrong in executing on that. But yeah. someone comes to me and says, here's an established company um, that has a normal business, um, but they're going to be in carbon capture in Q4. I'd be very interested.
Okay. All right. Each week, it's now time for our third company, but each week we always like to highlight some stocks that are either A, on sale, or B, are a trap. So we might be looking at our first trap here tonight. Let's now move. It's a shoe company based out of San Francisco. It was a Kickstarter campaign, or I should say company, and uh, they just went huge when it came to valuation off the hop. And it sounds like this company likes to sue a lot of people from some of the research I did. So it's called Allbirds, trades on the NASDAQ under the ticker symbol BIRD, which is B-I-R-D. Current share is 55 cents. Market cap is 80, 70, uh, 87 million, excuse me. And shares outstanding are 115 million. So Bill, as I said off the top, company likes to do a lot of suing. They've been involved in a lot of lawsuits, including with companies like Steve Madden. So what's the story and what you outlined or learned about this company tonight and why you're bringing them up. So the original Kickstarter campaign was to make uh, wool shoes instead of leather shoes. And here's a picture of uh, one of their flagship products. Uh, it's very look looks very comfortable, um, but it's it's made from natural, sustainable products um, from uh, uh, types of wool. Um, you know, and so the thesis is that this is an area that's growing, and I confirm that uh, sustainable fashion globally is supposed to grow at a CAGR of 22.9% to the year 2030. So people are very interested in this area. Um, so it was supposed to be a, a better design. People got really excited. They spent on marketing and brand. And so they got to a $2 billion uh, market cap in US dollars. Um, and since then, uh, things have been hurting. They're down about 98%. What happened? Just the SGNA was through the roof? Yeah, so this is this is one of the challenges. So first of all, they came up with a shoe that they thought was pretty profound, and then naturally, like it looks to me, it looks like a nice shoe. It looks comfortable. That's great. But then other companies saw the popularity, including Steve Madden and some groups yep. off Amazon, yep. and said, you know, well, we can make something kind of similar. You know, I, I don't think you can put a patent on wool. Um, maybe some of the things that they were doing. Um, but all of a sudden, they started suing other companies. And, and this stuff uh, was announced years and years ago. And still, mm. I couldn't find any news articles that anything was settled. Uh, as we know, this uh, these issues take years and years and years. Um, but but they were, they were all of a sudden, popularity shifts. We know this time, time again. And so because of that, uh, revenue started dropping. Um, with that, they didn't have a, a true uh, competitive niche and, yeah. um, investors started to get spooked. Hmm. So when you found what you find when it came to income statements and current cash flow, Yeah. So they, they had uh, 239 million in revenue last year, but their year to date revenue was down 17.4. Mm -hmm. But the thing that was interesting, they, they priced their shoes appropriately. They had a gross margin of 42.2%, uh, which is healthy. Yeah. So you look at that first. That's great. But a lot of times investors don't talk about the SGNA. They stop at a gross margin. So their SGNA costs are 90.5%. So that means that if you sell a shoe for a hundred bucks, you're spending nine over $90 on all things included, like branding or whatever that you're spending on uh, to be able to make this market. So it's just completely unsustainable. And they're 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 as we mentioned, their their market caps, $86 million. They had an EBITDA loss of $94 million in the last 12 months. Wow. The cost of building brands, right? Yeah. It's uh, something right. that scares me. Okay. Current liquidity. Like how much runway does this company have before? Well, uh, go ahead. Our, our first clue of an issue, the, the credit rating is minus uh, 1.6. They have total working capital of $140 million uh, as of their last reporting statement. So with their losses uh, that they're having, you know, maybe they have a year, year and a half of runway before they have to do something really material. Uh, to stay in business. It'd be a shame to be raising equity uh, when your stock's down that far. I don't think they have much runway with uh, people that would want to give them debt. Um, so there would be uh, something uh, material they'd have to get involved in um, that I wouldn't be interested in uh, supporting. All right, bring out your red flags. Moment of truth. This is your first company that you would not own. This is not a stock on sale. This is a trap. So X for uh, marks the spot, correct? Yes. Yeah. All right. So three down, two to go. And this is the next one. And it's an interesting one. This is an orange juice company that's based out of Florida, a Grove owner with over 54,000 acres of land. Where do you find 54,000 acres of land in the state of Florida these days, knowing how many people have moved down there? But this makes it one of the largest U.S. citrus growers in the country. It's a company called Alico which trades on the NASDAQ under the ticker symbol ALCO. Current share price, $24.50. 
current outstanding shares is only 7.6 million and daily trading volume is around 654,000. Bill, we've touched in the past about land value when it comes to some of these companies and it appears we have another one here. So break down, I guess, some of the numbers uh, as to like what this company is. And, and I guess in a lot of ways, as I bring up land value, uh, what their current share price is and why it excites you. Yeah. So the, I look at two things in these businesses. You want to look at what is the value of the land. And while you're waiting for the value of the land to materialize, uh, what is the business? Is it is a business you're going to be pouring money into or is it a good business or such? Mm. And so I had to look at this and figure out about this business. And uh, the first thing we have to look at is they sell uh, oranges for orange juice. So obviously the price of orange juice is a material thing. And so we yep. can bring up this chart here. Uh, orange juice is uh, doing very well. Uh, over the last uh, 40 or 50 years on this chart. And, and that's because of weather. Um, there's been some challenging weather globally uh, in places like Brazil and Florida with hurricanes, uh, cold weather and freezes and such. Yeah. Um, so because of that, that, that's been a challenge for them. It affected some of their output in the last two, three years, but has driven up the price. Uh, the, the second problem is, is, is the price fluctuations, but they're kind of uh, they're sheltered from this. They have long-term agreements. So they just signed a three-year deal with Tropicana to buy about 65% of their output. Um, the price went up uh, 33 to 50% in their press release compared to the past agreements they had with Tropicana. So they, they, they have this position where they can sell their oranges and their uh, orange juice. Uh, the risk is there's some weather events which can, uh, can affect this and make their earnings bumpy. Um, but it's an interesting, sustainable business while you're waiting for the land uh, to potentially materialize. Yeah. Good contract to have with Tropicana. So you said 33 to 50% higher. Uh, basically, they're selling their production at production prices. And last year, their prices were as much as 33 to 50% higher. Yeah, than last year. Yeah. So their new contract, they just signed the press release was about a month and made the comment that their future production prices are 33 to 50 percent higher, depending on the, you know, the varieties and where stuff is coming from and such um, than their, their their previous agreement. So they're locking okay. in at substantially higher prices, which is not uh, surprising with the chart that uh, we just saw about the price of orange juice. All right. Our next chart and stat we want to find and what was revenue last year? What'd you find? Yeah. So so. Revenue last year was 40 million and you're going to find out that this is a uh, uh, disappointing uh, for them because they had some weather events over the last couple of years that affected this. So actually they're, they're five, you know, compared to five years ago, uh, it's a negative 13.3% uh, CAGR on revenue and they had bad, a negative uh, free cash flow or leverage free cash flow last year as well, but that's because of the weather events. So this is a bumpy business. Some yeah. years your revenue is going to be very good and sometimes uh, not so much. But their normalized EBITDA, when I looked at the last five years, is $22 million a year. So, so how do you think that? Yeah, just go on. But I was going to say, how is that achievable? And it seems like in a very volatile uh, industry based on weather. Yeah, it's, it's just going to be going up and down. If the, if the weather is good, you're not freezing, you don't get big storms, you're going to have really big years. And years that you don't, uh, you're not going to have the same amount of oranges to supply to Tropicana. Right. Um, so because of that, you're going to be discounted. But normalized e EBITDA was about $22 million, uh, which when I looked at a market cap of $186 million, if you can just, you know, wait out through the years, yeah, um, th that that's okay. So uh, next stat I want to bring up, levered free cash flow. And another important stat that we want to bring up that we don't bring up as much is CapEx. And um, I guess, why is this important when it comes to CapEx with this particular industry? So you're always going to be spending in, in this business. Um, their leverage free cash flow is negative $39 million. Okay. When you compare that to a normalized EBITDA of $22 million, that's quite a spread. But they, they reinvest into their business. So last year, they were reinvesting $18 million into the business. So when you kind of look at that in a normalized EBITDA, uh, when they're spending on CAPEX, there's going to be a, a little bit of, uh, you know, maybe cash and normalized years uh, waiting for you after you uh, have a, a little bit of uh, uh, while you're waiting for uh, the land to materialize. Okay. So when we look at CAPEX and uh, look at some of the notable things that they would invest in, are we looking at more land? Like what would that be? Yeah. Um, you also, this is a capital intensive business for machinery and such. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be a, a big comment that I, that I saw on there. Um, so, and also there, uh, could be land as well. 
um, additional okay. land purchases as well. All right, EBITDA, what'd you find? Yeah, so normalized, we would say it's $22 million when I looked at it over the last five years. So okay. uh, that's, a, that's a reasonable amount compared to the market cap of the company. All right, moment of truth. Do we have another green check mark? When I look at the land values. So this is what we have to look at. So when I, when I, um, when I look at it, what I took a look at is if you sold um, the present value of the land, which doesn't show in accounting, and you took 50% uh, of their uh, farm buildings at the depreciated level, um, you would, and you paid your taxes on that gain, you would have a breakup value of $51 per share. And it's currently trading at $24.50. So a so, 2X. Yeah, it's a 2X based on the land value. So mm -hmm. my thesis on this is this is a company you can wait out and the land values are increasing. And they have stated goals that they plan on selling some of their land in the future. Um, so you can wait for this to uh, materialize. Now would be the time to sell land in Florida. The value of that, when you think of all the residential end of it all, where's a lot of their properties in Florida? Do you know? It was there. I saw a map. It was in different uh, places, but their head office was in uh, Fort Myers. Okay. Good to know. All right. Four down, one to go. And it's now time for our cannabis stock of the week. It involves multi-state operator Verano Holdings, a company that operates in 14 total markets, including notable states that include Illinois, New Jersey, other notable states, Ohio, is it set to go live? And also two emerging growth states pending approval of adult use cannabis, both Pennsylvania, which was some encouraging news this week pertaining to that state, along with the state of Florida, which was arguably going to be the biggest cannabis market in the world if adult use gets passed come uh, federal election night on November the 5th. Bill, they uplisted onto the SIBO Canada Exchange back last fall under the ticker symbol VRBO and on the OTC under the ticker symbol VRBOF. We've covered a lot with this company. We've interviewed a number of executives over the course of the last 18 uh, months. But like we did with Terrison last week, we want to walk people through. It's basically seven things to know when it comes to these companies and the numbers that basically we learned from this. So uh, let's first dive in as I go uh, back to our first question like we did last week. Let's focus on revenue growth. What stands out to you? Yeah. So when we did this comparable, this is a little bit different from last week because this is a comparable to all the cannabis companies that have a market cap over 500 million US. And so yeah. there's six of them. And so then we combine them into one, then compare how Verano would do. So when it comes to revenue growth, uh, revenue growth, where they really stood out the company is the last three years, their CAGR was 60.1%. Um, so that was huge. Um, you know, the averages were about 30 um, so they went flying in their in their revenue building and growth in the last three years. It slowed down in the last year. They came closer to the median of 3.1. And we saw yep. this across the board with yeah, the larger cannabis companies. Their revenue slowed down uh, in the last year. And we can see this where they're making plans, uh, you know, to spend and to invest in places that they're still waiting for uh, regulation changes to uh, support their uh, thesis. Big market share is within the individual markets that they're currently operating in, which is why it's flat right now, but at least it's not going down and consistent. But like you said, there's a number of growth states that are on the horizon. Um, okay, so revenue growth you've outlined. Next up, let's now focus on another important one, which is gross margin. Yeah, so here they they were the leader uh, compared to the, uh, the the large cap, uh, the larger cap, sorry, uh, uh, cannabis companies. They were at 51.4 and they increased that by 3.9% uh, in the last 12 months. So this was a lead position, and this is a very important uh, statistic to be looking at. Okay, third question I want to bring up. SG&A, would you come away with? This, this is interesting. This is one where actually they're spending more SG&A than the other companies. Um, so the question is why? And so there was clarification in the, uh, the last analyst call uh, that they had with their Q1 earnings. Um, okay. And they described it as being an investment in dispensary openings. Uh, additional people that they needed, and in technology. So they kind of felt that it was similar to spending on something like Capex, that it was going to bring them future um, cash flows in the future. Where I get concerned sometimes is where the companies are allocating a lot of SG&A to branding, yeah. uh, but this wasn't a branding decision, but it's still something to be cognizant in the long run. Uh, we like to see that SG&A get closer uh, to their peers. Well, they announced this week two new location openings, so it kind of backs up what they said on that analyst call. So uh, good to know um, as we move on to our next stat, which is 
uh, leverage? What'd you find? So this is something, you know, there's not a right and wrong to leverage. Uh, if you want uh, a more conservative company or a more aggressive company, um, for them, they're a more conservative company. And that would be something that would intrigue to me. So they have 46.5% or cents debt per dollar of assets that they have. So that's more conservative um, than the other peers that they have. Okay. Next important stat is liquidity. Again, what'd you find? Yeah. So the liquidity, this is a something that I see often quoted on LinkedIn or other people are saying, let's compare um, the liquidity or the current ratio of cannabis companies. But this doesn't tell you a lot because if a piece of, remember I just said a minute ago that they had less debt than the other companies, but their current ratio shows that they have higher liquidity risk. And this is simply just because of an accounting. They have a debt renewal coming in this year. Um, and once they renew that, it's going to shift back and to be normalized. And so I know that they have the ability to get debt renewed. They also are in a very interesting position that they predict on the, on the last analyst call I was on that $80 million of new cash flow could come in from 280E changes. Um, yep. that they're trying to take advantage of with their tax legislation. Um, so this is not something that was concerning of mine, but it still is an important uh, point to look at. Okay, fair enough. That makes sense. Cash flow, that was your second last question and stat. What'd you find? Yeah, so this is where they're a leader. Um, they have 9.3% of their revenue goes into leverage free cash flow. And this grew uh, significantly in the last year. That went up by 9.6%. So this is the year that Verano kind of proved their thesis with cash flow and it's yeah. happened in the last 12 months yeah one thing i want to highlight too and i think there was some uh uh dialogue going back and forth on x this week was about some insider buying and selling and there was insider selling this week uh through a uh, couple of the executives within the company and i know how retail investors can interpret that and uh, obviously given the current market conditions of the space uh i think people are just a little frustrated right now but i guess we're just kind of in a wait and see mode because there's no really volume in this space right now. But uh, I do think things will turn the corner once we see in the fall. But when we look at those things, um, how should you interpret that? Because I know there's a lot of things that we're unaware of. And let's face it, like there are times where, look, if you're an executive within a company, um, you have to do some insider selling for uh, tax purposes. But I don't know if that's the case or not. But how would you look at things like that? Um, there can be many, many reasons for insider selling. So you could be repositioning for uh, tax reasons. Um, you could you know, be having a change of family uh, status or such. Uh, there could be many reasons. What I pay attention to, and was a piece of advice I was given in 1999 by a mentor, uh, people only buy for one reason, and that's greed, and they can sell for many reasons. So because yeah. of that, pay attention to the insider buying, not the insider selling. And so because of that, that's always been my mantra since that time. Oh, very well said. Okay, last thing we want to bring up, valuation. What'd you learn? Yeah. So when I was looking at it, I, I went through three different valuation uh, exercises and they came up with uh, different prices. But when you blended them together, it was $10.08, which is a potential upside of almost 150%. So it's uh, something that can be very attractive uh, to investors now. All right. So moment of truth, uh, pending news out of Washington and uh, look, they're in Florida as well. So we've got Pennsylvania and Florida. Is this a stock? Like, look, we know there's a lot of cannabis companies that uh, people want to pick and choose from come in the fall once things start to hopefully turn the corner. But if that's the case, when that does happen, is this one of the companies within that space that you would own? Yeah. You know, my, my purpose when investing in cannabis is you want a collection of the strongest companies. Um, yeah. And this would qualify to be one of the strongest companies in that collection of uh, businesses that I would purchase. Well done, my friend. Another five companies in the bag. How many companies did you look at again this week? Oh, I think we went through about 40 or 45. <laughs> How much time does this take? Uh, it takes a lot. It, it takes uh, two or three days to put together a, a show like this, but it's, it's enjoyable work. Well done. Again, smash that like button. Give this man some respect for all of the work that he's provided again this week to give you some ideas and companies that you're not aware of and some of the stories behind it all. So if you haven't done so already, make sure to smash that like button, leave some comments below and make sure to subscribe to our baked in newsletter because you contribute a lot to that newsletter. And uh, this is where we feature a lot of the small cap companies as well. We'll tee up some of the companies that we're looking at for next week. So if you want to have access to some of those companies before we announce it next week, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter as well. Lots of research reports that you've unveiled over the past week, week and a half. So uh, 
some interesting stuff to say the least. If you had any feedback, did you get to your 20th follower on Twitter? Yeah, yeah it went way by there. Uh, it went blasting by. Some of them, no. I don't know how legitimate they are, but uh, they're interesting to say the least. <laughs> hey, growth is anything, right? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, that's great. Uh, all right. I will check back with you this uh, early this week. Uh, in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your evening and uh, appreciate all the uh, research again provided this week, Bill. Sounds good. All right. Take care. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for watching. Hey, we're humming along and it's all because of you and the audience and community that we're building. So again, make sure to smash on that like button and leave lots of comments. Who do we have up next? You let us know. Who should we interview? What companies? Is there anything you like? Is there anything we're missing? We're all here for you. Let's get on with each other and build this community for all of us to benefit. As usual, don't forget to subscribe to our channel because in the end, we wouldn't be here without you. Thanks again, everyone.